Well, it's my task to talk about Martin Luther King and the, uh, the black question in the United States. I'm not going to dedicate too much time to Martin Luther King because he's, he's a figure in the movement, but obviously there's a much bigger question here to deal with. But the reason we're uh, referencing Martin Luther King is that it is just over 50 years ago that he was assassinated on the 4th of April, 1968, um, a year which we're celebrating because of the revolutionary events that took place that year across the globe, including the United States, which I'll give some figures and references to the movements there later on. It's interesting that Martin Luther King, uh, he was assassinated in, in Memphis. He'd gone to Memphis in support of black sanitary public workers. Um, he was part of the struggle, obviously, for civil rights and equal rights for blacks, um, which still had not been achieved in that period. This group of black workers had been on strike since March the 12th, when he arrived, and they were on strike on, over wages and conditions. Um, they had suffered discrimination, and it's just an example of the kind of thing that was going on. There had been bad weather previously, and the workers were sent home. But the black workers received two hours pay for the day, whereas the white workers who were sent home were paid for the whole day. That showed still the level of discrimination that it existed. In this case, of course, it sparked off a strike. Um, now, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated by an obscure petty criminal. If you look at the guy, he's just a, a, a secondary uh, insignificant figure. Um, and who was behind the assassination has never really been fully investigated or discovered. Um, but many pointed the fingers at government authorities or people up on high. In, in any case, it was clearly a racially motivated assassination. And it wasn't the only one. I'll refer to others later on. Just days after his assassination, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was passed in the United States. That act contained the prohibition of discrimination in such matters as housing based on race, religion, or national origin. On paper, it established equality in these questions. Now, Martin Luther King had been involved in the Poor People's Campaign, which culminated in a march on Washington and a camp set up outside the White House, which continued also after his death. Now, he originated in the segregated South. He grew up in the southern part of the United States, where they still had apartheid. Um, blacks couldn't go in some places where whites could go, etc. But in the 50s, and this would have marked also his development, we have two cases. One is Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old black girl in Montgomery, who refused to give up her seat to a white person, which went against the Jim Crow laws, which were still on the statute books. December um, uh, the same year, uh, Rosa Parks, much more famous, an adult, because the, the earlier girl, the other earlier was a minor, was arrested for doing the same thing. She was arrested because she was an adult, of course, and could be arrested for such a thing. Arrested simply for not giving up your seat to a white person. This, these were the conditions of, of that period in that part of the United States. This event led to the Montgomery bus boycott led by Martin Luther King, which lasted for 385 days. That was the degree of anger which was sparked by that, what seemed like a small event. During this period, uh, King's house was bombed, uh, he was arrested, and he became a national figure in the civil rights movement. Just a little brief thing on the Jim Crow laws. These were introduced after the Civil War. Although they granted slaves freedom, i.e. they could no longer be treated as a possession, they introduced segregation into the system. Um, they weren't allowed the same civil rights. In effect, they were disenfranchised. And these laws stayed on the statute books as late as 1965. So in the 50s, when all this was happening, those were the laws which were in place. Now King, 
he uh, said many times that he stood for non-violent, peaceful pro protest. Um, he took part in the movement for blacks' rights to vote against, against segregation, for equal rights at work, etc. He opposed the Vietnam War. Um, he began to speak of, quote, a redistribution of resources, i.e. using some of the wealth to alleviate some of the worst aspects of uh, class society. Apparently, he even read Marx, but he drew the conclusion that Marx wasn't for him. Uh, he didn't agree uh, with the analysis. Um, and I'm being very telegraphic here, obviously, but this, this places King in the cat category of what we as Marxists would, would call a reformist, i.e. somebody who believes it's, it's possible to uh, gradually reform the evils out of capitalism. Um, so trying to improve the lives of the working class people without overthrowing capitalism. Now, of course, in the post-war boom period, that illusion would have been a very powerful one, that you could achieve such improvements for working class people because there was such a huge development of the economy. And with it came uh, in massive industrialization. Millions of blacks, for instance, moved from the southern states to the major cities into the auto industry and the other industries. And with it, of course, came jobs, wages, etc. Um, but there were some uh, black leaders who went further than Martin Luther King. For example, Malcolm X, who was assassinated earlier in February 1965. He started out as a black nationalist and for separation of blacks from whites. Um, but through the experience of the struggle, observing events, he eventually dropped this and he moved towards more and more towards a socialist outlook. He, he, grew, he grew to understand the need for unity across the color divide. In 1964, he came out with his famous quote, which I've seen a lot of comrades have reposted on their Facebook pages and things. You can't have capitalism without racism, which, which was a, a big step forward um, in, in, in the thinking um, of um, um, blacks involved in the, in the libera liberation movement. And I quote him in 1965, he said this, I am not a racist. I am against every form of racism and segregation every form of discrimination. I believe in human beings and that all human beings should be respected as such regardless of their color. That's a step away from the nationalism and the separ separatism and a recognition that the struggle has to be a common struggle of blacks and whites. He was reaching these conclusions and of course that's when he was assassinated um, because um, to, to have black leaders who um, base themselves on basically almost a kind of inverted racism, blaming all white people for the ills of blacks. That doesn't create a problem to the capitalist class because it helps to keep the workers divided along um, color lines, race lines, etc., ethnic divisions. But when you have leaders of the blacks rising above that and drawing more radical conclusions that this is a working class struggle, then those people start to become more dangerous, not less dangerous. Um, and then there were those who went even further. There's the famous Fred Hampton, murdered in 1971 at a very young age. It was, he was born in 1948. That would make him 20, 23 according to these figures. Um, he was a leader of the Black Panther Party in Illinois. And he was killed by the police during a raid in December 1969. Um, it was an open police assassination. They set up a spy who drugged Fred Hampton so when the police came in, he was lying in his bed with his partner, they just shot him cold-bloodedly, killed him on the orders of the, of the FBI. Now, Fred Hampton went much further than Malcolm X. He actually drew very clear class conclusions. If you listen to the videos that are available on the internet of him speaking, you'll hear him say, I am a revolutionary, a proletarian. Um, he refers to the international proletarian revol revolutionary struggle. And he, he says, racism is an excuse used by capitalism. He said, we don't hate white people, but the oppressor, whether he be white or black. He saw things in class terms, 
and um, he referred to the idea that we're, we're fighting amongst each other when in actual fact we should be fighting together. He had a class position um, which was a product of the 1960s and the radicalization that went with it. Now, just some context to, when, to what was happening at the time. Let us not forget we had the Vietnam War. Um, in March 1968, this is the same period I've just been referring to, four to 500 unarmed civilians were massacred in the famous My Lai massacre. Some of the women were gang raped um, uh, and their bodies were mutilated by American soldiers. This provoked revulsion in the United States and particularly amongst the youth. And then we have events such as uh, the, um, the shooting of students at Kent State University in Ohio, May 1970. Four students were killed when the National Guard opened fire during a demonstration against the Vietnam War. A further 10 were seriously injured. Some of those killed, if you look at the list, were just happening, happened to be there. Some were walking through the campus, some were moving away, um, some were just looking at what was happening. Um, they were shot in cold blood. This led to a nationwide student strike across the United States. Universities were closed down, occupied. Um, previous to that, in South Carolina State College, uh, February 1968, again, similar to period to in which uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Th three students were shot and killed by the police uh, while protesting against racial discrimination. Um, the result, the investigations led to the exoneration of the police and the only person charged uh, from those events was one of the students who was shot. Shows you the, the, the nature of the state. Now, this radicalized the student mo movement to an extreme degree. At the same time, as this student radicalization is taking place, which is in line with what we saw in May 68, in Italy in, May, in 1969, and across the globe in Mexico, Pakistan, we have a growing radicalization of the working class, um, a growing worker militancy, especially young workers and black workers. The blacks were moving into the cities, as I said before, and becoming proletarianized. And for example, in 1967, 40% of the United Auto Workers Union um, was under the age of 30. It was a very young working class, very young um, uh, people going into industry. And in the mid-60s, it's not by chance, therefore, that the strike levels begin to climb. Again, in line with the statistics you have for Germany, for Italy, for France, for Britain, everywhere you have the same kind of statistics appearing. Um, between 1967 and 1971, the number of workers taking part in strikes in the United States doubled. Um, and I, I, this was a consequence of the pressure of capitalism. This was the boom. These were the so-called golden years of capitalism, of the post-war boom. But see what happened. Between 1955 and 1967, industrial workers' weekly hours worked went up by 14%, not down up. Workers were working longer hours. Corporate profits in the same period were up over 100%. In those years, the capitalists doubled their, their profits. Now, um, the number of industrial workers also grew, which is a clearly a positive development from a, capitalist point, from a Marxist point of view, sorry, because it increases the strength of the working class. The number of industrial workers in that same period, i.e. 55 to 67, went up by nearly 30%, a massive strengthening of the industrial working class. But output went up by over 90%. So they're squeezing more surplus value out of the working class. They're investing massively in technology, therefore you have automation, but you also have speed ups, checks on brakes, uh, how hard the workers are working, how fast they're working, etc. And the trade union leaders, the American trade union leaders, agreed to all this. This was all agreed in the contracts, in the, in the uh, uh, agreements they made with the bosses. Um, and this led to an interesting process, which was one of the rank and file from the early 60s onwards. You see the beginnings of a change in the trade union leaders. They're getting replaced. Local officials are being voted out. 
new officials, more radical, more militant, are being voted in. And then at the same time, you have wildcat strikes. Wildcat strikes because the trade union bureaucracy was putting a break on the movement of the working class, holding them back, doing everything to try and keep social peace. In, um, in 1960, there were 15 wildcat strikes in the different Chrysler plants. In 1967, 49 wildcat strikes. In 1968, over 90. That shows you the growing rank and file militancy of the workers in an attempt to circumnavigate the bureaucracy which was holding them back. What was happening to black workers' wages also um, was part of uh, the process. In 1950, average wages of black workers were 60% the level of white workers. But instead of improving through the boom, it actually got worse. 1955, average black wages went down to 55% of white workers' wages, and 1962 to 53%. Basically, by the mid-60s, the average wage of a black worker was half that of a white worker. But it wasn't just wages, unemployment. The rate of unemployment amongst blacks was double what it was amongst whites. But the number of industrial black workers was massively increasing. And this was a significant element in the situation. Detroit, for example, had a majority black uh, uh, population at that time. And large numbers of blacks were entering the auto industry in and around Detroit. And in the period 1969-73, we see uh, a rank and file rebellion, not just against the bosses, but also the trade union leaders. This is what was happening on the workers' front, which is parallel to the radicalization taking place amongst the youth. So what you have is a historical discrimination against blacks, which is pushing the civil rights movement. You have the uh, growing militancy of the working class, a huge reaction and a radicalization of the working class, particularly the youth and the blacks, but the working class as a whole, <coughs> growing levels of strikes, combined with the reaction against the imperialist war in Vietnam and the protests against that, combined with the repression that the state meted out, shooting unarmed students on more than one occasion, where students were shocked by, by that they couldn't believe. If you listen to the, to the survivors of, of, of those events, they say they, they saw police shooting into the crowd and they thought they must, they must be shooting blanks. They would never do such a thing. Instead, they were shooting live uh, ammunition and killed the students. All of this massively radicalized um, uh, the movement and explains why you had, of course, you had Martin Luther King, who was a leader of the civil rights movement, but limited himself to trying to fight for improvements within the system. And then you have the much more radical layer, such as the Fred Hamptons, who draw very radical revolutionary conclusions about, it's not about race, it's about class, and it's about class struggle. Um, this was what was being produced in the United States, the most powerful capitalist country on the planet and one of the two big superpowers um, of, of the time. So although we had the economic boom and the economic growth and all the rest of it, the other side of it was that, of course, being a class society with all the injustices of that, all these elements came together to produce a very radicalized situation in the United States. And in those conditions, had there been You've discussed May 68 and other uh, movements. If the French workers had taken power in May 68, this would have been followed by the workers of Italy taking power very shortly afterwards. Britain, in 1972, was on the verge of a general strike. I remember it. I'm a little less young than you are. Um, I remember my dad being on strike for seven weeks in 1972, coming home every day, I had, a good, I had a good lesson in the trade union politics even before I joined the organization. For seven weeks, I, I was told every day what happened at the factory assembly um, and how the, the, the mood was going. Of course, the end of that was that he was really angry with the trade union leaders because they sold out. But um, that was a taste of the, of the mood that existed at the time. The country was on the verge of a general strike. So you can see that May 68 in France could have led to a revolution in Europe. And what I've just described about the United States shows you that potential was there 
also in the States. And there's this myth that uh, America was a bulwark of reaction. I can remember in countries like Italy and France in the 60s, the 70s, they used to talk about the Americanization of society. Well, they ignored that there was another side to Americanization. What I just described to you could also be called Americanization, i.e., the American working class rising up and challenging um, the system. Now, um, more, some more general points about the um, uh, racism and the black question. Um, there are attempts, or there were attempts in the past, to find a kind of scientific justification for racism, i.e., um, blacks are inferior intellectually, only good for hard labour. Of course, there's no basis to that whatsoever. In actual fact, there's no such thing as race. When we talk about racism, I know it means discrimination against people who look different. But there isn't actually any such thing as a black race or a white race. There's no genetic basis to it whatsoever. The colour of your skin or the kind of hair you have is actually a very minor difference. You know, I've had cats over the years. I've had black cats, white cats, ginger cats. They're all cats. <laughs> and none of them ever say, I'm not playing with you because you're a ginger cat. Um, cats don't do it. And humans, humans in normal conditions don't do it either. If you put black children and white children to play together when they're very young, their instinct is not to say, oh, you're black. I'm not playing with you. It just doesn't happen. It does not happen. What does happen is as they grow up in this class society, the racist element where it does exist is passed on to the next generation and what is potentially a harmonious society is transformed into a society based on um, racial discrimination. But there's a reason why they invented the idea that blacks were somehow um, inferior and, it, and it's not from the Roman times, it's not from feudalism, it's actually capitalism that creates the need to develop the idea that somehow blacks, African blacks, are inferior somehow. Why is that? Um, because, well, first of all, if you can divide the working class according to colour or language or religion, then that plays a useful role in dominating the working class. In Northern Ireland, there is no physical difference, really, between Protestants and Catholics. I can't tell a Catholic from a Protestant by looking at him or her. I can tell a black from a white simply from the colour of the skin. But in Northern Ireland, there's no, nothing, nothing whatsoever. And yet, they've managed to successfully create a divide, which led to thousands of people being killed du during the Troubles. Why? The British ruling class created it in order to divide. Divide and rule. It's a classic. If you look around the whole of the ex-British Empire, Cyprus, nice little division there between Cypriot-speaking people and Turkish-speaking people. India, partition, Muslims and, um, and um, Hindus with millions killed in the process of partition. Wherever you go, they left little presents for the people. You go to Nigeria today and you find the divisions that exist within that society. And again, they're all black in Nigeria. It's not a white-black division. And yet there are houses who are discriminated by Yorubas and vice versa, Igbos. There have been terrible wars and killings as a result of this. So a division based on language, religion, or some kind of identity, in this case colour, plays a very useful role in um, dividing um, working class people and pitting them against each other, i.e. If there's not, 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 not enough jobs, it's because of the immigrants. Um, it's um, because of the foreigners who are coming here, taking our jobs, etc., etc. And of course, this is fomented by the media. If you read uh, the, the media, the local media, little examples of, you know, girl is uh, physically attacked or raped. If the attacker is black or Muslim, that adjective will be added to the report. If he happens to be white and has a very English name and he happens to be a Christian maybe, well those adjectives are, are superfluous. They are unnecessary to, to, to it make, it makes for shorter news report, uh, less adge fewer adjectives. Uh, the reason is it creates this idea that 
well, the blacks are more violent, they're more dangerous, the immigrants are more criminal inclined. In Italy at the moment, they're fomenting racism to an incredible degree. The other day, there was actually a report, a bus in a town in northern Italy, a black immigrant was pushed to the back of the bus, the bus, and the driver helped in pushing him to the back of the bus. Now, there's no laws in Italy which says that blacks have to be somewhere in a separate part of the bus doesn't exist. Those laws don't exist. And yet, that's happening. And if you read the press, it's a constant barrage about how dangerous everything has become. I've spoken to people who say, oh, I used to walk down here, but I don't walk here anymore because of all these blacks. And I say, can I ask you a question? Do you actually know somebody in this neighborhood who's been physically attacked by a black? Uh, no. Ah, oh, okay. So why are you frightened of being attacked by blacks? Oh, they're criminal, they, thief, they, they rob houses. I said, do you know anybody in this neighborhood who's been uh, burgled by a black? Mm, no, no, it's always the same. And I said, so what are you frightened of? What are you frightened of? And are you telling me that it's safe to walk the streets when it's just Italians? There's no such thing as Italian criminals. There's no such thing as the mafia or the ndrangheta, which clearly was invented by the blacks who've just arrived, you know. <laughs> Um, but it shows you the power, also the propaganda. It's a conscious policy. We have the Minister of the Interior who is consciously promoting um, racism. The Mayor of uh, uh, Riace in the south, who, who applied a policy of integration, a very intelligent policy actually. He revived the town because of the emigration of Italians with blacks from Africa and, 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 uh, and Asians and Middle Eastern people. And they've actually revived the, the town creating jobs, they've opened the bars, reopened the, house, the houses that had been abandoned. This guy was put under house arrest and now he's been expelled from the town, he can't go back to his hometown. The other night he slept in a car. This is the mayor of Riace um, in the south of Italy. So they're promoting racism as a conscious policy to divide. Why? Because of the crisis of the system. The system is in a deep crisis the deepest crisis it's ever been in, in actual fact, if you look at what's happening around the world. And therefore, the promotion of racism is a conscious policy to weaken um, the working class. Marxists oppose all forms of discrimination, whether it's based on your gender, your orientation, your age, your language, the religion you believe in or don't believe in, the color of your skin or whatever. We oppose all forms of discrimination, all forms of oppression, and we fight for the right of everybody to live their lives as they wish. Now, the point is this, the origins of the racism towards the blacks is in the slave trade. You see, initially, they didn't use blacks to work on the plantations. They, they used indentured workers, whites, Irish, and others, who literally sell themselves for a period of time um, in order to get across the Atlantic and try and hope for a better life um, in America. Now, they, of course, that was limited because eventually you'd finish your contract, you'd be free. Um, they, tried, they tried to enslave the local indigenous population as well. The problem with that is that once, once um, a Native American escapes from slavery, back to his tribe or whatever, it's difficult to distinguish the slave from the non-slave. The beauty for the capitalists of the blacks of Africa was you bring blacks to the United States and their very physical appearance, and, and that's connected to being a slave, makes it impossible for that person to escape into freedom because they escape, but they're blacks. They're just picked up again, taken back to the master. Um, so with it also came the need to uh, create the idea that they are inferior. Because you see, human beings naturally don't like treating other human beings as if they were animals. That's a general tendon, a natural tendency. But class society has to brutalize human beings and make them believe that they're somehow inferior. Um, I had the joy yesterday of watching Italian TV, the national because they did badly at football, so we forget about the World Cup in Italy. But the national women's volleyball team, I don't know if you know them, they beat China 
three sets to two the other day, and they're in the final against Serbia. So Italy now is all, hey, we're in the final of the Women's Volleyball Championship. But three of the girls who play for the team are black. One of them is of Nigerian parents, and she scored the final winning shot. Apparently she's super fast when she hits the ball. I was watching it and I was thinking of a few people I know in Italy who are quite racist, and I thought, I wonder if they support this team or not. Um, it brings out the contradictions, of course. Of course, when they're interviewed this week, perfect Italian. It's a new phenomenon, of course. But going back to the question of creating this idea that they're inferior, they did that to justify the terrible treatment of the slaves in the United States. They're not human beings. They're not like whites. They're, they're below us. They're on the level almost of animals. Um, the Romans uh, didn't have black slaves. The Romans were much more democratic and uh, egalitarian. Everybody could be a slave, white, black, or, or, or whatever. And they just, um, they just did things like crucify them in the thousands if they're ever dared to rebel, like the Spartacus Rebellion. But they had no icon concept that you were inferior because you were of a specific color. All they said was they called slaves um, a tool with a voice. It's a rather, you know, nice way of calling human beings a tool with a voice. He's not really human, but he speaks like a human. In the States, they created this myth of the blacks. Now, of course, we saw that the, 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 the liberation of the slaves was also part of the development of capitalism. Initially, black slavery played a useful role for capitalism in the cotton fields, played a role actually in Lancashire and uh, in the north in the development of industry, the supply of cheap and plentiful cotton worked by slaves um, in, uh, in America. But as capitalism develops, slavery becomes unproductive. It's no longer productive. Um, Marx refers to it when he, when he explains, you see, you have to put tools in the hands of workers. And you want workers who will respect the tools and treat them in a certain way, and you, you've invested in them. What interest does a slave have in anything that he does. He doesn't even have a higher wage at the end of the day if he or she works harder. He just produces more wealth for the boss. He still owns, still owned by the, by, by, by the landowner and has no rights whatsoever. But as capitalism developed in the North, they moved in, the, in a different direction. In the same way, in a certain sense, that in Britain in the past, they had to provide a huge supply of labor for the cities by literally expelling the peasants, and they were white English peasants who were being expelled off the land, pushed into the cities, capitalism requires what are called free laborers, i.e. free to sell themselves on a daily basis to whichever capitalist is prepared to employ them. Um, and of course, a plentiful supply of unemployed workers also helps the capitalist to hold down wages because it's a pressure on, on the working class. And so the, the, real, the material base at the end of the day for the liberation of the slaves was to be found in capitalism um, itself, which ended with the ending of slavery. But as you see, it didn't reach equ full equality. I just refer to the Jim Crow laws and the discrimination, which continued blatantly until, um, until the, um, the, the, the 60s. But in spite of all the formal equality on paper, if we look at the statistics, we see that blacks are still not at the level of whites. Um, in the United States, something like 13, 14% of the population lives in poverty. But among the blacks, it's over 25%. Um, unemployment amongst the blacks to this day is more than double what it is amongst um, the whites. Now, some blacks have made it right to the top, haven't they? Obama. What an amazing liberation of the black people. Or nice people like um, Condoleezza Rice, if you remember her. Or Colin Powell, the army officer, the black army officer. You see, capitalism uses racism and color uh, to divide the working class. But there are moments when the same capitalist class, which can be responsible for terrible racism, such as in South Africa, when the class struggle becomes so powerful that it risks overthrowing the system itself, like in South Africa. You see, they had a problem in South Africa. Black and working class was like interchangeable. 
If you were black, you are working class. If you are working class, you were black. There were some white working class, but a small minority. The bulk of the proletariat, i.e. the people producing a surplus value, were blacks. And the discrimination was blatant with the apartheid system. In the struggle of the South African working class, in ending that system, you see how flexible the bourgeois is. The white capitalists are prepared to make all kinds of concessions when it comes to equality be before the law, um, and also in promoting some blacks to become capitalists. I'll give you an example. Cyril, Cyril Ramaphosa. You know him now as the president, but he used to be the leader of COSATU, the trade unions. And I have a video of him speaking in 1985 at the founding congress of COSATU. And you hear him speaking, they're, they're talking about the symbol of the union, which had to have the wheel of industry, but also a woman, because women are part of the workforce. And the colour, red's got to be in there, because red is the colour of socialism. This is the guy who now is a multi-billionaire and a leader in South Africa. He's been bourgeoisified. He's been allowed to become extremely rich. I'll tell you something. You do not become a billionaire simply as the general secretary of a trade union, although some of them do get some good money um, and it helps them on their way. This, this guy was promoted in order to be able to say we have now blacks in the government. In fact, if you look at the government today of South Africa, it's overwhelmingly black. So you would say, wouldn't you, the blacks have achieved freedom. But if you go down into the black neighbourhoods, you will find the same social and economic conditions that existed before when it comes to health care, um, schooling, etc. So equality, be be equality before the law under capitalism doesn't mean equality. That's the point we have to stress. Because you can, you can be equally sentenced to death for killing somebody, or you can, be, um, uh, you can have the right to be employed in a certain sector. But if unemployment is double what it is amongst blacks to whites, you're still equal in the law. You're equal in the face of the law. Um, but in actual fact, you're very unequal because it's capitalism. Capitalism is not a system that is based on true equality. Capitalism is a system which is based on the exploitation of labour by a minority of the population, which is called the capitalist class, which exploits the working class and extracts surplus value from the working class. And then in this society, we're all equal, but if mum and dad have a lot of money, they can pay for a very good school, can't they? And if mum and dad have uh, social problems, economic problems, unemployment, single mothers without um, another parent to help, low income, etc., live in a particular neighbourhood, then those children do not have, this, they're not equal to the parents, to the children of the parents who can pay for the private school. I've been to a school, uh, it's called Eltham College, my daughter goes and does her music exams there, and it's a private school, and, they, and it costs something like £100,000 to send your child for five years to a school like that. And I look at the school and I think, wow, and I, I feel absolutely disgusted. Not that the those young kids have got that. I'm thinking, this is what everybody should have. This is what all kids should have access to. And the wealth is there, but they don't. Then I have my wife who works in the nursery in a very rundown area, and she tells me that the majority of the kids she deals with have special needs. They, and they don't have the staff to deal with them. Children who are violent to other children, children who are be with obsessive behaviour, learning difficulties. And those children could be helped if they had the extra staff. Instead, what we have is a cutting of the staff because they're cutting back on spending because of the austerity. Now, in these conditions, where you already have unequal relations between blacks and whites, between immigrants and, and, uh, and, and local people, then what you, what you have is the poverty is generated and regenerated and it remains. It doesn't go away. Even though on, um, on paper um, we have uh, equality, like in Britain, you have equal wages, don't you? I mean, 
Nobody can employ a woman and a man and pay them different wages. And yet, if you look at the average wage differential between men and women, not only is it still there, since this crisis began, it's got wider. The average wages of men, the last figures I saw, were something like £24,000 a year, and the average wages for women, 18000 It used to be twenty-one. Now, how do you explain that? Well, uh, women mainly work in um, childcare. That's a fact. And childcare is paid very low wages. So, although a man working in the same nursery would get the same wage, you, are, you very rarely find a man working there. Occasionally you do. Cleaning and a lot of other jobs, it's the same thing. Uh, women, because they tend to have babies and men don't, the boss doesn't like to employ them in certain jobs or will prefer to keep them on a temporary contract so that in six months or a year's time they can get rid of them, which means part-time work, precarious work, uh, unstable work. The sum total leads to inequality in practice, even though in theory the law says you're equal. And that's because it's, um, it's the capitalist system, clearly, that um, uh, is to blame. I have a lot of stuff here on black nationalism in America, but I don't, I'm not going to go into it. Um, there's a material on the website which, which, which you can read. There's a document by the American comrades on black nationalism, which is very good, which goes into, in, in, into great detail into the history of slavery, how it developed and why, the struggle against slavery, the civil rights movements, etc. Uh, it goes into the Black, Pan black Panthers. There's a very interesting article on the American... Um, uh, on the, the US website um, on the program of the Black Panther Party, which analyzes it in, in detail. This is all material which, if you're interested in further studying this question, I would, um, I would look it up. If, you, if you're interested, it's actually called, called On the Program of the Black Panther Party, Which Way Forward for Black Workers and Youth? And this is the one I've got is part one, and it's from 2014. Um, the, uh, the, the document of the American Comrades is called The Black Struggle and the Socialist Revolution, published by the Workers' International League and available on their um, website. Um, I, I strongly advise you to read it and maybe hold meetings of Marxist societies based around these documents and maybe uh, the lead-off I'm giving here, which is more of a general, um, more of a general character. Um, now, the question of how to fight uh, discrimination, racism, etc. Um, there's been a lot of um, talk since the 60s of positive discrimination, of uh, favouring blacks when there's a job comes up, um, in a kind of try and redress the historical injustices. We as Marxists would argue that we shouldn't limit ourselves to deciding who gets the limited number of jobs. You know, there's 10 black unemployed and there's 10 white unemployed and there's two jobs. You give the jobs to two blacks. You haven't solved the problem for the other eight blacks. You have provoked a resentment amongst the 10 unemployed white who say, why, I'm in the same condition as them, why are they getting it? It doesn't help to unify, it actually divides. And it actually explains why some people like Trump or others um, can actually use this to lean on the poor layer of the white working class to try and drag them towards a reactionary position. What we require is a revolutionary position which says, we want a job for all of the 10 blacks and all of the 10 whites. That's the way to stop one, divisions between people based on colour because there won't be any resentment because he got it because he's black or whatever. And that means that what Marxists should fight for is not this or that small redress because think of it this way. If a whole factory is going to close, what's the point of positive discrimination in jobs? All of them, black and white, will lose their jobs. If you introduce the concept of discrimination, let's say half the factory has got to be sacked. If you apply positive discrimination, you'd have to say logically, white workers first, i.e. get the sack. Imagine what that would do for working class unity. It would, it would actually strengthen racism. It would strengthen the right wing. That is actually what has happened. That is part of the explanation of what is happening at the moment with these parties. Because the left is not 
giving a serious explanation as to the nature of the crisis, what it's about. Because it's basing itself on a reformist outlook, it cannot answer the burning questions facing working class people. Working class people are actually facing some very dire conditions. Um, again, I was in Italy in the south last week. A uh, comrade took me, I took him home to his, his block of flats. He said, there should be 15 families living in this block of flats. There's 15 flats. He said, there are over 40 families living in this building. And I said, how does that work? He said, it's the sons and daughters of the older generation who've lost their houses. Their houses, they've lost, they can't pay the mortgage. They can't pay the rent. So what you have is a son comes back with his wife and kids. The daughter comes back with a husband and kid. And they have one family in each room. When I saw that and I saw the neighborhood, I thought, this is an explosion in the making. This is a social explosion that's being prepared. The problem is, of course, the left doesn't explain. The answer, of course, is expropriate. The millions of, of, of empty homes which exist, there are more homes empty than families that need them. But they're being kept empty for speculative reasons. In order to fight that, you don't do it with some cosmetic change here and there. You've got to expropriate the big corporations that own um, the housing. And it's the same with the rest of, um, of the uh, economy. Now, in America today, going back to the States, we have the Black Lives Matter. We have the shooting of blacks. It's much more likely you'll be killed on the streets if you're black than if you're white. There's an inbred sort of racism in the police force um, itself, even though there are black policemen, of course. But in general, the tendency will be to regard a black as dangerous. You've seen the videos of black guys, he's put your hands up, in spite of that, he ends up getting shot. Um, if he's white, less likely to happen. There's the, that they still have the discrimination, the racism, and the de facto inequality before the law. They talk about equality before the law. Where's the equality before the law when if a policeman turns up, you're not equal. If you're black, you're more likely to be kill, killed or beaten up or die in the hands of police officers. Um, black Americans have the highest death rates of any ethnic group in the United States. How do you explain that? Well, it's the economic conditions, the education, the health care they don't have, um, the, the living conditions, etc. Um, some statistics from 2005. Average family income. 67,000 for whites, 38,000 for African Americans. Uh, college educated um, is uh, they're 33% higher. Uh, African Americans is 20% 20, 20, 20 sorry of the, of the population. Uh, living in poverty, whites 9%, blacks 26%. If you live in poverty, if you go to a school which doesn't have the staffing, doesn't have the, the funding, you're more likely to end up in the wrong end of the spectrum of income in society because there's a there is a class divide. Now, um, as I said, under capitalism we're not equal because there are social and economic inequalities. There are rich and there are poor. There are those who can pay for good education and those who can't. And racism keeps coming back. Even when there are periods, if you looked at Britain up to about 10 years ago, you would have said, oh, look at the integration, look at the multiculturalism, look at how things are moving nicely in the right direction, the laws are there and all the rest of it. And then you have Brexit and the, the right wing side of Brexit, the nationalism that went with it, which was we want to kick all the immigrants out. Um, racism comes back, even where it seems that it was uh, going down. And the reason why it comes back is because it's a useful tool for the capitalist class. And even if it's not there, they will revive it, or they will, they will, they will, blow, they will blow on the, on the embers of racism, which are below the surface, and light it up once again. Because capitalism needs a scapegoat. Um, um, they need somebody who can be identified as the cause of the problems. Not enough housing to all these immigrants. Now, uh, the target is, of course, Muslims. Islam is the target. And they're using the, the, the wars in the Middle East, the terrorism, and all the rest of it, 
to pinpoint Muslims as, as the, the force to, to blame. Uh, yesterday, on the news, there was another of these gangs that uh, groom young girls. But you notice there was a gang that was all white English who did the same thing, didn't make the news headlines. I thought, why? Why doesn't that one make the news headlines? They're both awful. They're both um, disgraceful human beings in the way they behave. But if they're Pakistanis and Muslim, they make the headlines. And if they're white English, they don't. Why? Because the idea is that it's a, it's a, it's a process of transforming Pakistanis into monsters. They are monsters because they're Pakistanis. They're monsters because they're dark, because they're Muslims. And therefore, we have to fight them. And that is provoking a division within the class um, itself. As Malcolm X said, to return to him, you can't have capitalism without racism. And the point is, capitalism is a system which, because of its very nature, returns to crisis. Crisis comes back because of the contradictions of the economy. I'm not going to give an economics lesson here. I'm sure you've all discussed Marxist economics. Um, we've got to bring out the lessons of the past because what we see, what we saw in America in the 60s was, in, in effect, the black population, the black working class, their consciousness reaching the point of understanding that it's not just blacks, but it's a class struggle. And in struggle itself, we've seen it many times in strikes, the workers come together. Men and women fight together against the boss, not fight each other. Uh, blacks and whites come together and fight the boss, whatever color he is. They learn from experience that, you know, if you had a strike, imagine having a strike and you say only the white workers are, are going to go on strike, or only the black workers are going to go on strike. Who would win would be the boss? Because he'd, he'd have black legs or, um, who uh, would be prepared to work um, against the strikers. So our task is to build working class unity. We have to explain the class interests, what's behind all this with facts and figures, and also understand that through class struggle, racism begins to break down. The opposite process begins. The capitalists promote division, class struggle brings workers together, and the workers begin to see in the process of struggle who the real enemy is. It's not your workmate that's the enemy. It's not the black cleaner or the black care worker that's your, uh, um, your enemy. It's the boss, whatever color he has. You know, in, in South Africa, in the rising struggle against apartheid, the, the, there used to be a classification on your documentation, whether you were white, black, or colored. And one of the slogans of the rising youth movement, and the black youth used to shout it, they would, they, in the classification, they would say, not black, not white, not important. That was their slogan. It's not the issue. It's the issue is the, the nature of society. Reformism cannot do this. Even the most left of reformists will fail to combat racism at the end of the day because racism is not fought by making appeals to people to be nice to each other. It's fought by solving the economic and social uh, problems, the material basis upon which racism can thrive. And if there's growing unemployment, growing poverty, increasing austerity, and people are suffering, and people are really suffering. Young comrades should really go into some of the working class neighbourhoods and just talk to people. Just listen to the problems they're talking about. And you'll realise what an explosive mood exists down, right down in the depths of, um, of society. You can't uh, remove racism in that environment simply by appealing to be nice. It's by raising the class issues and saying we need houses for everybody, jobs for everybody, health care for everybody, and highlighting the super profits which the capitalists are making. They have money for certain things, they have the billions for Trident. When it comes to the potential to destroy the whole of humanity, they have billions and billions. When it comes to financing an extra teacher of special needs in a nursery, they don't have the money. Um, this is the society we live in, and we have to highlight that. Capitalism inevitably enters into crisis at some point. That's abundantly clear now. The last 10 years are, ten, are years of crisis, and it's creating greater tensions. 
and it's uh, seeing the rise of far-right groups based on racism um, and discrimination, violent attacks on people of, of, of colour or on women, etc. And it's only a revolutionary programme which can cut across that. They, they, they accuse us, the Marxists, of being utopian because we think we can change society. The utopians are the ones who think that in a society where unemployment is growing, whole neighbourhoods where the mass of the population is unemployed, poverty is growing, cuts in healthcare, cuts in pensions, people are literally going hungry, food banks are on the increase all the time, that in these conditions you can make some kind of wishy-washy liberal appeal against racism and think that it will work. They are the utopians, not us. Unless you expropriate the capitalist class, you take the wealth which has been accumulated by the working class and use it to build the houses, to build the nurseries, to employ the extra teachers, to improve the transport system, etc., etc., then you're not going to fight the phenomenon. If we change society, gradually over time, racism will die down and eventually it will disappear because it's not a natural way of being for human beings. But you have to con create what I would call the natural way of living together for human beings, which is a social question, and it's, it means a radical change in society, which means a revolutionary overthrow of capitalism. And that's what we stand for.